the land of Israel was the land of grapes. Grapes were important to the people of Israel commercially and domestically as well as religiously. Near the end of Jesus' ministry upon the earth, he gathered his closest friends together in an upper room that he had borrowed from no doubt an acquaintance in the city of Jerusalem. They were there to observe a feast of the Jews, and as they were feasting, he took some unleavened bread and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples after giving thanks and told them, this is my body which is broken for you. And after that, he took a cup, the fruit of the grape. And when he had given thanks, he said, Drink ye all of it, or all of you drink of it. For this blood is the, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. We've done that here today. But he was instituted by Christ on that day. I'm not sure how much those friends of Jesus understood what he said on that occasion because they had difficulty in embracing fully what he had taught them about himself. That he would die. That he would be buried and raised again. But they are there together, and in the feast, not only the Passover that they observe, but the supper that Jesus instituted, there is the importance of the grape. This morning, I want to talk with you about the message of the vine. We've been singing about it. A few moments ago, we read about it, and if we embrace the message of the vine, it will change our lives. Now, let me begin this morning by giving some background to the text that we read from the 15th chapter of the book of John, and then we'll come to the text itself. The feast that was observed that night with Jesus and his disciples was the Passover. It commemorated the deliverance of their fathers from Egyptian bondage centuries before. And God had said in instituting the Passover, do that every year. I don't want you to ever forget this. And they were there for the Passover. The atmosphere must have been electric because so much had been happening. Earlier in the week, Jesus had come to Bethany, the little town across the mountain from Jerusalem, and he had spent considerable time in the home of his special friends, Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Others had been there, and it, it was a time of rejoicing and feasting. And Jesus had made that triumphal entry into Jerusalem, riding on the back of a donkey, declaring himself to be the long-awaited king. And he had come into Jerusalem and debated with the religious leaders and had put them to shame. It was a great time. And no doubt those disciples believed that surely the kingdom of God was here. But then there were some announcements that Jesus made. He said that he was going away. 
and that they couldn't be with him now. He said, the ruler of this world is coming. They were disappointed at his announcements. They were disturbed by what they heard. Because it seemed to them, no doubt, that the promises and the aspirations that Jesus had g given and that they had embraced were coming to nothing. But then Jesus gave them the answer. You see, Jesus had taught that he had come to give abundant living to those who would follow him. That is, he would give them at the very center of their being life, real life, full life, joyful life. But then that life would spring up into them so that they could live abundantly. They would be full and overflowing. And now he's made statements that have caused them to wonder. But he gives them the answer in the message of the vine. And that's what we want to look at this morning. So, if you will, join me in the passage that we read, John chapter 15, and let's notice what Jesus said in those final hours before he left them, promising, however, that he would come again. Now, after the background, I want, first of all, to look at the true vine. And there are three things that Jesus emphasizes here. He says that he's the true vine. There was a vine before him, and that vine had originally been the nation of Israel. The Jews had been God's vine in the Old Testament period. In the fifth chapter of the book of Isaiah, the prophet put it this way. God had planted a special vine on a special hill. He had fertilized it and he had watered it and he had nurtured it. He built a fence around it to protect it. But when he came to receive the fruit of the vine, there were only sour grapes. Now, what did that mean in the context of Israel? It meant this, that Israel had forsaken God. Israel had not fulfilled the purpose for which God had brought them together to honor him, to praise him, to glorify his name. He had done everything for them. But when the time for fruit bearing came, there was nothing but sour grapes. Now Jesus has come on the scene and he says, I am the true vine. And where Israel failed, Christ would succeed. His disciples would be commissioned with a work to do that would glorify God. So Israel was the original vine. Jesus is now the true vine. And then the third thing is my father, that is God, is the husbandman. That simply means that he is the nurturer of the vineyard. He is the owner of the vineyard. And with that setting, Jesus teaches us some wonderful truths that we all need to embrace.
because these truths are the way to abundant and eternal life. So the next thing is the branches. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Now, who is he talking to? Well, obviously, he's talking to his disciples. And he said, you, you individuals, you people, you followers of mine, you are the branches in this vine. You know, down through the years, there have been some strange applications made of Scripture that are far removed from what Scripture teaches. For example, in seeking to approve of denominationalism, the proposed followers of Christ being divided in all kinds of religious groups. Some have come and come to John 15 and said, Christ is the vine and all the different religions are the branches. He isn't talking about religions. He's talking about individual followers of his, the disciples he is addressing. And he said, you disciples, you are the branches, and I, I am the vine. Now, what is the purpose of the branches? What are they to perform? What is the goal that the vine has for the branches? Christ is the vine, we're the branches, and Christ is looking for a great harvest to the glory of God. You disciples who have been disappointed at the fact that I'm leaving, he's saying to them, the fact is I'm going away so that I can be with you forever. And I want you to bear a great harvest to the honor of God. So the disciples are the branches. There is a goal in mind. Now notice how the text unfolds. Jesus said at verse 2, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now, notice that Jesus is going to talk about four levels pertaining to fruit bearing here. And the first level is there are branches that do not bear fruit. And we see that he says, that any branch that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. And in a very real sense, that's exactly what happens. When the caretaker of the vineyard finds branches that are not doing what they're designed to do, he may cut them off and, and take them away. As a matter of fact, a bit later in the chapter, in verse 6, he says, if anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and withered, and they gather them and throw them in the fire, and they're burned. I'm going to return to that statement in a moment, but for now, yes, the vine dresser does take branches that are not productive. But there's something else here in the text that I don't want us to miss this morning. Notice he said, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now, you may have a footnote in your Bible at that point, takes away. And the footnote suggests that the word that is used here may mean to take away, but also to lift up. And that becomes important 
to this reading for us. Because it is true, isn't it, that all of us want to be branches that bear fruit. And the very word that is used here for takes away means to lift up. And it is the same word that is used in regard to the feeding of the 5,000 by Jesus earlier in his ministry. And after the multitude was fed with a few loaves and fish, they took up 12 basketfuls. That's the word used here, took up. It's the same word that's used when Simon of Cyrene was commissioned to carry or to take up the cross of Christ. And so you may be wondering, well, why are you belaboring that point in order to make this point? When there is a branch in the vine that is not producing, the vine dresser is going to give it every opportunity to do so. He's going to lift it up. It may be that it's covered up with dirt. And he's going to to take the dirt away and and lift that branch up. And, And he may tie it up so that it can reach its full potential. One of the levels of fruit bearing here is the vine that doesn't bear, or the branch that doesn't bear. Christ wants to lift it up. And he's going to give us an opportunity to bear the fruit. And if we simply will not bear the fruit, then verse 6 applies to us. He's going to take it away. So there are branches that bear no fruit, but they have the potential. Now let's keep that in mind. Every one of us in that vine, that is, we are disciples, we have the potential to do what he has called us to do. But in in these verses, there is a second level of bearing fruit. He said, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lifts up or takes away. And every branch that bears fruit. So there are some that bear no fruit. There are some that bear fruit. They bear some fruit. And Jesus said, the husbandman or the vine dresser purges them. He's going to care for them. There are those who bear no fruit. They can. There are those who bear some fruit. Then notice further. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. There's no fruit, some fruit, and more fruit. But look at verse 5. I am the vine and you are the branches He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. That's really what he's looking for, isn't it? He's talking about the branch remaining in him and he remaining in the branch so that the branch may bear much fruit. Now, where do you think you are this morning in that? Is it no fruit? Some fruit? More fruit or much fruit? Which is it with you? Now, I'm not asking that question so that I can tell you where you are in those levels. I want to know where you think you are. Where are you in the fruit-bearing business? So there are four levels. Now, let's, let's come to the next point. Verse 3. Verse 3 is the preparation point of emphasis. 
He said, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Now, God has revealed these things to us in words. Words have meaning. And the words that are used in Scripture are not just taken out of the air. They're the very words that God wanted put there. And it's interesting to me that in this instance, Jesus said, you're already clean. And that word clean is a synonym to the word then that's translated in verse 2 as prunes. He prunes it. He says to the disciples, I've made you clean. I've prepared you to bear much fruit by the word that I spoke to you. Now, clean and the word. I can see the, the vine dresser going into his vineyard and washing the leaves and the branches so they can do that for which they were intended. But I'm also reminded of what happens after the church begins. Now, this obviously is before Jesus died. He has disciples They're going to be later set in the kingdom. But the church will begin on the Pentecost of Acts 2. And in Ephesians 5, verses 25 and 6, the Apostle Paul said this, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and Cleanse it. Jesus said, now you're clean. That he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water and the word. He says they were clean because of the words that were spoken to them. And I would suggest so are we in our acceptance of the good news of Christ, in our obedience to the gospel, because Christ has cleansed us by the washing of water and the word. Jesus himself said before he left this world, he who believes, believes what? My word. And is baptized. What is that? In the Christian system, what is the washing? And that's how we are cleansed today. It is a preparation for living what we become, for being what we are, a branch in the true vine. Our obedience to the gospel is the beginning point, the preparation for fruit bearing. Now, the next point, verses 4 and 5. Not only does Jesus prepare the branch for fruit bearing, he encourages in fruit bearing. Hear him. Abide in me and I in you. And let me stop there and make the observation. Jesus uses the term abide a dozen times in this text. It's so important that we remain where he has planted us. And he has brought us into relationship with him. And so the branch is in the vine and the vine is in the branch. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So the encouragement is this. You abide in me, and you'll bear fruit. Now, what question does that naturally lead to? How am I going to abide in him? It's not just something I say or talk about. He said, abide in me, and I in you. How can I do that? 
And so the next point is made at verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them, throw them into the fire, and they are burned. You must make a choice. I must make a choice. He's not going to force himself on us. He's not going to make us do what we're not willing to do. But the choice that we make, whether we will abide in him or not, is a choice for heaven or for hell. And there is no neutral ground. And it's not a matter of what I plan to do sometime or what I'll get around to at a convenient time. It is a choice that I'm making now. It's whether I'm going to abide in him. And then... In verses 7 and 8, there is the blessing. I've been encouraged I'm to make a choice, and here's the blessing. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done. By this my Father is glorified that you may bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Now, there's two things at least that we'd emphasize there is the blessing. The blessing is we abide in him and God hears and answers our prayers. And if we abide in him, he said, you will be my disciples. Now, becoming a disciple of Christ or being a disciple of Christ is to hang a sign around your neck and say, I'm a disciple, right? Nothing could be further from the truth. No, it is abide in me and bear fruit. Then you are my disciples. That's the blessing. Now that brings me to the question I raised earlier. If these blessings belong to me when I am abiding in Christ, how can I abide? And Jesus doesn't leave us in the dark about that. As a matter of fact, he answers the question as to how we are to abide in him in verses 9 through 12. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Now watch, abide in my love. Does that give us any insight? If I abide in him, I am blessed by God. And I know that I abide in him if I abide in his love. Well, how can I abide in his love? He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So notice how this text unfolds. He said, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you abide in my love, just as I keep the Father's commandments and abide in his love. Do we know any more about how to abide in him than we did? Add to that the fact in verse 11, these things I spoke to you that your joy may remain in you. Those who abide in him have this sense of well-being at the center of their hearts that flows out in the activities of their lives. When the Bible speaks of the joy of the Christian, it isn't talking about being God's laughing clowns. But it's talking about a sense of well-being. So abide in my love, in obedience to my will, then your joy will, he said, be full. And then in verse 14, he said, you're my friends. So be a friend of Christ. How can I be a friend of Christ if you do whatever I command? 
Now, all of that is designed to bring us to the important issue of the fruit. The purpose of the branch is to bring forth much fruit to the glory of God. The bearing of the fruit is to abide in Him by abiding in His love, obeying His will, and being filled with His joy. It's then that we are His friends. So how are we, how are we going to put that into action? How are we going to know that we're branches in the vine? Now, I want to mention quickly four words. One of them is through our work. In Ephesians 2 and verse 10, Paul had just said, We're saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You cannot earn your relationship with God. So that's out. And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the next verse. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. That word literally means masterpiece. We as Christians are God's masterpiece which he has created in Christ Jesus. Now think about that. With all of our flaws, we have been recreated. And we're his masterpiece. He's making something of us if we'll let him. But notice this. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Works of faith are always essential. And the fruit that we're to bear is good works. What good work have we done today? And I just want to say that there is not a single thing that you ever do in service of God by serving others. There is nothing that you do, that God forgets. And when we come together like this today, we come in that front door, and we ought to make certain that not a single person ever enters this building as a stranger and leaves as one. That's a good work. When I come, I'm not bound up in myself so that I can't see anybody. And every act of service that is done by every person around here to make this kind of meeting possible, that's a good work. And when you take notice of somebody who is in need and you seek to supply that need, that is a good work. And that is fruit for him. Now, the second thing is worship. Hebrews 13 and verse 15 says, By Jesus Christ, let us offer unto God the fruit of our lips, the sacrifice of praise. When we worship, that's fruit. And when we just would decide that we're going to do something else instead of be with the church, what's that saying about who we are? Our worship is fruit. Add to that our wealth. In Romans 15, Paul was on his way to Jerusalem with the contribution that the churches of of Macedonia and Achaia and other places had given for the poor saints in Judea. And he said, when I've borne this fruit, when I have delivered the fruit to them, 
That's the fruit that all those who gave. Whenever you give something here on Sunday or you give something in your life to the glory of God, then that's fruit. And the last thing, but not the least important, is winning others. A vine produces grapes. Christians produce Christians. And you may be thinking right now, I don't know how to do that. Well, let me ask you this. Who do you know? We all know people. We, we have family and friends who are not right with Christ. And we may not know what to do with that, but we could say, come with me. And I dare say that not many of us are saying that to people. And fruit would be born. My time is gone, but I want to close with this. The other day in our evening studies on Sundays, I talked about Mary and Martha, the sisters who were having Jesus in their home, and, and Martha was busy with planning a meal, and Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet hearing his words. And Martha represents many of us. We are absolutely so busy. And it isn't that we're busy with bad stuff. We're busy, and it may be good stuff. It's just not the best stuff. And Martha was saying to Jesus, let me prepare this meal. And that was a good thing. Let me prepare this meal. I'll be with you in a minute. And there are a lot of us who are saying to God, I'll be with you in a minute. When I get all my stuff taken care of, I'll have some time for you. But Mary, commended by Jesus, said, I'm going to sit at his feet. I'm going to hear his word. I'm going to make the right choice. I'm going to give proper priority. And I'm going to be a fruit-bearing branch in the true vine, Jesus Christ. And it begins with the washing of water and the word. And it continues as we look for opportunities to serve others. And we'd like to help anyone who would respond to Christ along the way. Let's stand together and be singing. Let's rise up and live.